Um, well, we can get started on the questions. I can start whenever you want to start. Rachel, you'd like to start? Have you got a mic next to you somewhere? We need our microphone. Oh, here's one. So. All you need to do, when it's off like that, it's actually on. Oh, it is on. Uh, and then you just turn it to mute when you don't want okay. to hear things. So yeah. it's just that, that's all you need to do. Okay, fire away, Rachel. It's in relation to God's gifts. Yep, yep. How do you know when you're responding to a, a true desire and, and, not, and still not an addiction or through fear or spirit influence? Okay, so the question really is like, there's the issue of desire, which ones of them are actually motivated by coming from within myself, firstly, compared to outside of myself. So there's, that, there's two sides of that, isn't there? There's either within myself or outside of myself. If they are within myself, then how do I know whether it's pure or not pure? If it's outside of myself, then uh, how do I know that's happening? Um, you know, when, when I'm not used to uh, understanding anything about it. So they're, they're all good questions and, and sometimes difficult to answer. Well, all, I, all I did myself all the way through this life is I haven't had anybody in my ear to tell me when it was out of harmony with love or in harmony with love or any of those things. So, so what I had to do myself is measure through the results what was going on. So, so if I acted upon a desire and, it turn, and, and that desire was out of harmony with love, then there would always be some kind of negative effect. And the reason why we often ask this question is we're not prepared to look at the negative effect or feel the negative effect. Does that make sense? What we finish up doing is we finish up uh, trying to know whether the desire is pure or not pure before we act upon it. My suggestion is there are many desires that you will have that you know are impure quite easily. Does that make sense? So, so for example, if you're in a relationship with somebody right now and you desire to have sex with another person, then obviously you know the desire must be impure. Either the desire is impure to stay in the relationship or the desire is impure to be with the other person. But there's one of the two desires is impure because there's some kind of unlovingness in the entire process. So a lot of our choices and decisions we do know when our desire is pure or, imp or impure. So let's focus on the ones that we don't know are pure. So for example, we get a feeling. So we get a feeling of, oh, oh yeah, like I would like to move. So it might be a feeling we have. Um, how do we know whether it's pure or impure? Like, how do we know whether it's spirit motivated, whether somebody's pushing us or not pushing us? How do we know all of those things? That's the question, really. Right. So, so one way we know is by focusing on the desire itself and pray, praying about these desires. Now, the beauty of prayer about desire is that it's very, very hard for an unloving desire to remain present while you're praying. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? Like, it makes sense when you think about it. Um, let's say I had an unloving desire that came to me during the course of my day, but I didn't know it was unloving. And so I might get home at night and I might uh, sort of sit down and I might do a, a bit of a daily ritual I might have going of reading some spiritual material which heightens my personal condition in that moment, just temporarily. And then I might you know, have some pray prayers with God about following the desire. Now, in that moment, if the desire feels lessened by the interaction with God, then it's highly likely the desire has some kind of impure element in it. Does that make sense with everyone? But if the desire is heightened by the interaction with God, then it's highly likely that the desire has some pure elements in it that I can act upon and respond to. Do you see the difference? You see, oftentimes what we do is we have a desire, but we don't want to, and, we, and we, if we're confused about it, we don't finish up taking it to God. We, we just sit there and mull over it, you know, like, oh, what do I do here? Do I do this or not do this? And then, then what we do, instead of taking that to God, we also go across to people around us and we say, what would you do? <laughs> what are you doing? You know, and it's a bit like I said yesterday, you know, when we go out to dinner and we, instead of feeling what we want, 
we then ask all of our neighbours what they want as if that somehow is going to fix what we want. And, and that's the problem with many of our desires is we do want to share them and we don't want to just have them and own them ourselves. But on top of that, we have a tendency then to not take them to God. We have a tendency then to not discuss them with God. And my suggestion is if you discuss them with God and you find the desire is heightened by the discussion, then there's a higher likelihood that that desire is loving compared to being unloving. Does that make sense? And the reason, the reason why is quite simple. And that is, every time you pray to God and have a longing for God's love, you automatically create temporarily this protective shield around yourself. Does that make sense? And then as that protective shield is, surrounds you, now any external influence on your desires are very, very difficult to maintain for those spirits. So any spirits who are in a place where they're externally influence you, in the moment of your prayer, they're going to find it very, very difficult. Um, I, think, uh, I think it was Monica, wasn't it, Monica, when you were at our place, you had a vision one night that um, showed you when you prayed that all of the dark spirits just disappeared and they couldn't even stay there. And then as soon as you stopped praying, they all just came back straight away. And then when you prayed again, they all left again. And when you can't pr uh, stopped praying, they all came back again. <laughs> and, and that's something that we often don't bear in mind, is that whenever we have this connection with God, because we have a, a strong passion for this connection with God, it prevents influence of, of spirits, negative spirits in particular, from influencing our passions and desires. So that's, that's important to understand. Also, our addictions influence our desires, obviously. So, but when we're praying to God, there's less chance of us being in an addiction than, than there is when we're not praying to God. And this is why I say, when you pray to God and you find your desire is increasing, then there's a good indication that you need to follow this desire. However, many of you get uh, feelings that you should do something and you feel quite positive about them right at the beginning. You notice that? But then when you talk about them with others, the doubts creep in. If you notice that? Well, that's an indication that your original passion or desire was probably pure, but now your desire to discuss it with other people and get their approval is impure. There's, there's addictions in that process. And so you're better off actually acting upon your original desire and seeing what the results are than you are discussing it with five people with all d five different sets of injuries and five different sets of emotional conditions and soul conditions that are all going to impact upon whether they feel you should do it or not. So my suggestion is, firstly, prayer to God is, a, is, a, is the first way in which you can work out and work through a lot of your desires as to their purity or their impurity. And prayer to God is also another way of sorting out the influences you are under when you have desires. But even if you don't do those two things, in other words, you don't pray to God and you don't worry about the external influences, there is another feedback mechanism and that is when you follow your desire, if it is impure, it will soon become apparent. Right? And the way it becomes apparent is by the impedance against the desire that happens. So, so, so the resistance around you that happens towards your desire. So, so let's say I have a desire to move and nothing works. Nothing goes smoothly, everything breaks down, <laughs> you, know, everything, you know, everything just goes badly. Right? Well, there's a very good indication that there's some impure desire there because if you had a pure desire to move, usually your soul's purity in desire is a powerful creator of everything happening around you quite smoothly. Does that make sense? So I look quite deeply at everything that doesn't happen smoothly myself. So when we have a desire to do something myself and Mary and it doesn't seem to come together very easily at all, then we both look at our own like what's impure within us that is causing this to happen. And, and sometimes it's quite uh, small things. Um, I remember one time we were, uh, we were driving home in Little Zippy, which uh, uh, all of our vehicles are named by Mary. And, uh, <laughs> and Zippy is a little uh, Hyundai from 1984, uh, 1994, sorry, um, that's done about 250,000 Ks and, and uh, and uh, doesn't fit very much in it. 
And then I, and I drove home a ute that Gary and Angela had given me. This, this is an old Toyota Hilux ute, right? And we're driving home together and, um, and, and I'm in front, she's behind him. And, it, and anyway, uh, I pull over on the side of the road, you close the door of the uh, ute. Uh, this is coming home from one of these venues and walk into a shop to buy, to buy some water, come back out and I've locked my keys in the car of the ute. Huh? So I'm sitting here, it's, it's, in the, it's about 9 o'clock at night or 9.30 at night, something like that. And we're in RACQ, but I'm just sitting there going like, you know, why have I done this, what's going on? And then, ah, oh, then I realised there was a spare key. That's right, I had a spare key. So I got the spare key out, put it in the door of the ute and broke the key off in the... <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's a key inside and now there's a key that's broken off in the door. <laughs> right. So, 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 I, so we go, so I, by this stage I'm starting to feel frustrated, right? So, so, so I go, yeah, there's something in this, there's something in this that we've got to look at. And I get really, uh, I let myself get angry and frustrated, have a bit of a yell like I showed you before. And then, uh, it was in the middle of the town, it was in Kilkeven actually, <laughs> on the way home. And um, so there I am, uh, just, and, and then we sit down on the side of the road, we give the RACQ a call, hour and a quarter or whatever they're going to rock up. So I've got an hour and a quarter to process some emotion. <laughs> so, so I'm sitting there and all of a sudden it came over me of how much I was not loving myself having these very old vehicles uh, that we were always trying to keep maintained and keep looked after and, and everything because firstly we didn't have the money at the time to actually get something newer. We didn't have the Commodore, uh, which is called uh, sorry, Merlin, that's right. Yeah, sorry. Um, so we didn't have Merlin at the time. <laughs> we didn't have Merlin at the time. We only had Z Zippy and what did we name the youth? Sorry? Jolly, that's right. The youth name's Jolly. Anyway. So, so anyway, so we, we had these two really old vehicles that we were having to maintain all the time. We're doing, we're doing, like, we're doing close on average probably a thousand kilometres a week on average, uh, maybe even a bit more than that, um, you know, travelling. So, so, you know, of course they, and, and our sound system is bigger than Zippy. <laughs> so, 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 so that's going to be an issue, but anyway. And so, so what happens is, uh, is we get there and all this is going on and I'm sitting on the side of the road just cry, having a cry about um, the lack of love I was having towards myself and, and then I started connecting to why and, and what I connected to emotionally was that I was doing it to please Mary's viewpoint of money and I realised that I was actually sacrificing what I would normally do see I've, I've never ever had an old car my entire life actually <laughs> until uh, these two cars and um, and I, I not my entire life I remember a time when I was in my uh, early teens uh, uh, late teens early 20s where I had an old vehicle too but since then I've always had quite good reliable vehicles and I realized that the emotion within me was that I was trying to please Mary's concept of money rather than actually staying true to my own concept of money. So it was all about, for me, pleasing Mary's concept of money because at the time we didn't have very much and I didn't feel like we should just go out and get some finance to get a car or something like that, you see? And, uh, which we could have done at the time. Um, and so, so that night I made the choice and decision to, uh, to actually go and get a reliable vehicle. And... Uh, and, and so that following week, we went and bought Merlin. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we bought Merlin uh, on credit cards. <laughs> and, uh, and as it turned out, uh, from the donations we received after that, from that moment, our donations actually doubled. You wouldn't, that's strange, isn't it, when you think about it? Like, before then, our donations were very, very like much less, not enough for us to go and even contemplate getting something, but because of the desire to get, some, to get something that was going to benefit us in the long run and showing more love to ourselves and, and everything, now what happened was the, the money come along to pay for that, to, to pay for that thing 
so that we could have a reliable. So now we, we can travel with our entire, well, some of you have seen the back of our car from the, from the uh, front seats back is full to the roof generally when we travel. And uh, without Merlin, <laughs> the wizard, we would have a lot of trouble, uh, you know, travelling and doing these seminars. So, so um, it all sort of worked out positively. And, and you could see, firstly, my desire to not get something n newer, something, it's not brand new, but it's something that's reliable. My desire to not get something reliable was driven totally by an impure desire to please Mary. Does that make sense? And once I went, allowed the law of attraction to bring me the event, and then I start working through the event, express my frustration firstly at being stuck in the middle, in the middle of Kukiv and you know, waiting for ROCQ at 9.30 at night, you know. Well, actually, it might have been 10.30 at night, actually. It was pretty late anyway. And, um, and, you know, we were both wanting to go home and go to bed, basically, and, and we're still basically an hour or so from home. And, and it, my impure desire to please Mary created the situation. And my pure desire to actually change that created a different situation, <coughs> which was to actually go and get a vehicle that was, that was demonstrating more love to myself and automatically the law of attraction changed so that we could actually pay for that. Does that make sense? So, so, so up until that point, I wouldn't have known what to do. Like I would have continued to take this option of, of doing the other, thinking that we had to live within our means and all these different things. And the irony is that I didn't ever believe those things. I was only accepting them because Mary, that was Mary's set of beliefs. And so it demonstrated the depth of my hook into pleasing the woman. Does that make sense? Which, which meant that I had to ad address quite a few personal issues myself about that. Yeah. So does that answer your question? So, so in those situations, what I did was I just acted upon the design and look at the result. Now, if the result was I went out and got a new car and, and uh, the result was that I was skinned and I had to sell my house and so then obviously my new car desire was impure then. Does that make sense? But most of us are unwilling to, do, to take the risk. And so what we do is we don't know what to do and so we go and ask everybody else what they would do in our situation. But what they would do is related to their desires and their emotions and what happens to them as a result of that is related to their law of attraction. Do you follow me? And so because of that, asking somebody else is really like almost a pointless situation in that in the case, unless you're getting advice about something that you don't know about, then it might be different. But when it comes to making choices, we often try to place the choice on another person in order to avoid taking full responsibility for the outcome of that choice. Right? And when we do that, we're not operating in a pure desire either. So, so the desire will be exposed upon the action, but if you want to make sure of it a bit more before you act, pray about it. That's the moral of the story. Really feel about it, the desires, yeah. If we can go to Anna too, thanks. It should be on off. Yeah. AJ, I remember um, listening to the Glenorchy um, sound thingo. The Glenorchy sound? Oh, in New Zealand, yep. yeah. Yeah. And you said then that um, taking out a loan from the bank was really unloving and you were giving away, this is what I remember, you were giving away your power to, like, to, to those people who were giving you the money loaning you the money and so yeah, I'm quite confused um, What was the that. context of the discussion? Um, Carla had asked a question about whether she should do up her kitchen, I think. Yeah, but if you, if you listen to the context of the discussion, Carla was saying how much she was already broke and getting into more debt day by day. Do, do, do you remember that? That was a part of the discussion. So let's get the context of the discussion. The context of the discussion was day by day, Carla was getting into more and more and more debt. She was driving herself into debt. And the more you drive yourself into debt, the more you become under the power of the people who are your debtors. Does that mean, or who are you, sorry, your creditors is the right term. So you become under the power of your creditors. So the more you drive yourself into debt, the more power there is in your creditors in your life. And you need to accept that 
if you go into debt. Now, many people don't accept that. What they do instead is they get angry with the creditor when the creditor doesn't give them a break when they themselves entered the state of getting the credit in the first place. And it's very unloving to do that to yourself, definitely. Very unloving to, do, to put yourself in the power of another and then, and then also on top of that, criticise the person who has the power. Does that, does that make sense? So, so the context of the discussion is very different to the context that I just described to you. Yep. Can I ask what your emotions were when you decided to um, buy a car but you didn't have the money? My emotions were we want to do more teaching, we want to do this regular travel. Our cars were, we were spending, we were, the way it was working we finished up spending more money in maintenance of the vehicles than we would have spent on buying another vehicle. Right? And, uh, and the only way I could buy a vehicle at the time, because we didn't have an income, was to actually put it on the credit cards and then just pay off the credit cards, which is what happened. And, and what happened was, in, in, in hindsight, what happened was, in three months we fully paid off that new vehicle. Right? So, so we remained in debt for the very, very short period of time, and that is the most loving thing for you to do, if you can do that. Yeah? So, so my, my emotions were, directed primarily by love of ourselves like, and I just sat on the side of the road crying about how unloving I was to myself just accepting things as they were more, more unloving not about the vehicle but more unloving about how I was interacting with Mary does that make sense? Mary you want to say a few things about it too? I just wanted to add that from my perspective, I was living in a lot of fear about abundance and I was also had a bit of a poverty uh, complex from my upbringing about you should never spend money on cars actually because they're a liability. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so the difference I see between the two examples, Anna, is that I was living in a state of fear and I wasn't in God reliance. I was saying, you know, I, we, we've got to look after, we've got to sti be stingy, all of that kind of thing. Whereas Carla had the opposite emotion going on where she felt that I deserve these things, mm. I, you know. She was placing herself else in more debt because she felt she deserved to have <laughs> abundance, but she was creating abundance through debt rather than actually actual abundance. Does that make sense? Like if AJ and I had have um, gone ahead and bought the car knowing that there's no conceivable way that we could pay it off, which is quite different to the that feeling... That would be a very unloving choice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what, what it was is just having more trust in uh, this um, thing that if you spend money, then you receive money as well. And I didn't have that... Uh, I had to work through a lot of emotions on the side of the road. As soon as we sat down and figured out what was going on, I went, whoa, I've got a huge emotion about this. And yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we were sitting on the side of the road in the curb <laughs> dealing with our stuff, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as we often do, actually. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so, so in the end for us, what it, what it meant was that we had to make choices based on love of ourselves and love of everybody else who would have been involved, including the people we borrow from. If you're borrowing from somebody and there's no way you can ever pay it back, then th can you see there's a moral issue there too? That would also be an unloving state if, if, if you got into that situation. So you'd want to work out some way to pay it back if you're in that, in that space because the most loving thing to do would be to do that. But I learnt through my business life, obviously, a lot of lessons about money. And, uh, and a lot of lessons about spending money and love of self and all those other things which Mary herself hadn't learned. But when we got together, I started hooking into her emotions about it rather than th even feeling about what I'd already learned because of this bigger emotion in me of please my soulmate, please my soulmate that was going on, you know. And so my real issue was about my soulmate and how, how far I would sacrifice myself. And that's what I actually cried about on the inside of the road was how far I would actually sacrifice myself and make my life more unpleasant to please Mary. Um. And for me it was a big lesson about how, like I didn't, I wasn't even aware that AJ was in, because no. I thought everything's fine, you don't, I've, I've never had a new car, I've <laughs> always had a second hand car, so I thought yeah, life is fine, yeah. and I wasn't realising how if I'm carrying an unhealed emotion it automatically creates a projection. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And so Mary was projecting this at me, but my problem was that I was so sensitive to Mary's projection that I automatically changed what I was doing even though I'd already learnt the lesson previously in my life. And we often do this, right? We often do this in our interactions with our partner or someone we want to please. They, our interaction with them becomes so important that, that everything else sort of goes by the wayside, you know? And all the principles of all the things we learnt go by the wayside too sometimes under those circumstances. And so that's what I had to work my way through. Does that make sense, Anna? Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Pete, can you if we have a mic over with Peter? AJ, I've got a, I've got a can desire. Can I just stop you for a moment, Pete? Some of you who are putting up your hands have a real, real strong, like, pushy feeling coming from you. And I'm purposefully not going to ask, answer your questions today. Does that make sense? So have a look at that really strong, pushy feeling coming from you. Fire away, Pete. I've got a desire to tell lots of people about the Divine Love Path. And, yep. and I've noticed that my success in talking to people who are um, uh, traditional Orthodox Christians is limited because yep. uh, the thing that they say to me is that um, Every word written in the Bible is, is, is written by, is God's word yep. and therefore um, it doesn't talk about what I'm talking about, therefore it couldn't possibly be true and what they believe that's set in concrete. And I've never known what to say to them uh, or how to get around that and basically the conversation has just failed. Um, and yep. I, I was wondering, because you, obviously you know lots about I don't know which parts of the Bible are, are changed, which parts are correct, or how, how would you approach that when you were talking to somebody if you could, there was a chance that they could get really interested but you just didn't know what to... All right, well the first thing in any conversation with any person is you need to understand their emotional condition rather than what they're saying to you. So, so it's a, this is a very important thing to understand is a lot of times the intellectual banter that goes between the two of you is very, very different to what's actually going on emotionally between the two of you. And it's very important to understand where they're coming from emotionally. So, so let's say there's a Christian and he says, he says, the Bible is God's word. Right? Now, when you ask them a few questions, they'll probably finish up saying the Bible is God's only word. In other words, there is no further revelation other than the Bible. And in fact, the Bible actually claims that. So um, in one of the books uh, that Paul wrote, he actually claimed that there is no further revelation other than that that's already been revealed. Right? So there's been some modifications of the Bible which actually cause people to believe there is no further revelation other than the Bible. And a person who is passionate in their belief of the Bible is, is by definition, going to believe that. Does that make sense? So they're going to believe the Bible is God's word and there is no further word from God and there's no further w word. And you could say, well, do you want to reason on this logically or not? Because if you want to reason on this logically, I can actually prove to you that the Bible is not God's only word. Now, I wouldn't be saying that the Bible isn't God's word at all because the truth is there are many truths in God's word. My entire development in the first century, getting to a condition of one with God, was the directly res the result of the prophets that I read in the Bible. Does that make sense? So how can then you say that actually the Bible isn't God's word at all? The truth is that the Bible has been revealed. The, the books of the Bible were revealed step by step over many uh, over thousands a thousand years nearly. Um, and, and these books, many of which were, were actually like a medium here sitting down and channeling some information. So the truth is that a lot of the Bible is channeled information from spirits, from who they call the Archangel Michael or Archangel Gabriel, who often were the source of the material. Uh, God gave that material to those, those angels, shall we call them, six fear spirits they were at the time, and then those particular six fear spirits gave the information because of the development of the prophet or the medium could give the information to a person on the earth with a lot of accuracy actually in, at the time. A lot of it pertained to the Israelites and their way of life and the way that they were walking away from love and walking away from God. So, so once we understand the history of the Bible, the fact is that a lot of it is 
the, the word of God in the sense that a lot of it is what God would talk about with regard to love or what God would talk about with regard to moral morality and so forth. So when we instantly dismiss all of the Bible, we're really entering a place now of danger because we're actually dismissing quite a lot of God's actual truth and there's no need for us to do that. However, the point of contention from, from our perspective is, from the, po from the point of divine truth, is if the Bible is God's word, is, is only God's only Lee word. <laughs> so now what we can do is we can say to them, well, do you want to reason about this or not? Now, if you want to reason about this, does it make sense to you that an infinite God can pack himself into about a thousand or fourteen hundred pages? Does that make sense to you? that an infinite God can do that. Because surely if there's an infinite God, because the Bible itself says that God is infinite, does it not? So if there's an infinite God, surely infinite by definition means that we're going to continue to have to learn truth, more and more and more and more truth. By definition that surely is the case. And so what I would do is I would encourage them to reason about infinity and to reason about love which are the primary messages of the God. So in other words, encourage them to focus on the primary messages of the Bible. One of them is the message of love. Right? And most Christians, particularly Christians who are quite dedicated to the Bible, can see the message of love. In fact, the, the Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, are often referred to as God's message of love to the earth. Does that make sense? So we can focus on the love side of it or we can focus on what does the Bible tell us about God and so therefore if it tells us that God is things like this, infinite, then surely the Bible cannot be God's only word. It makes sense, logically. Now if the person wants to actually you know, be illogical, then all we can say to them is actually you want to be illogical because of an emotion. What do you emotionally get out of the Bible being God's only word? What do they get out of it? Well, they get a lot of things when you think about it. Right? Because security. they get security, personal emotional security. Because, because what does the Bible do? The Bible tells them to do certain things. And they sort of make the assumption then that because the Bible is telling them to do certain things, that means then that if I'm doing those things, God loves me and God approves of me and I'll be right come the afterlife, basically. That's the principle, isn't it? And then if I don't do those things, God's will God will punish me. So another thing the Bible tells me is that God is a God of love. In fact, the Bible actually says God is love. Right? And then I focus on that, all right. If God is love, does that mean he ever has hatred? Do, is love and hatred the same thing? Obviously not. Would, is love and anger the same thing? Now, many Christians will actually tell you that love and anger are the same, uh, you know, that a person can be angry and loving. Many Christians will say that. The truth is, obviously, that God is not a rageful God. But the Bible does say that God is a rageful God. Now why, and I would go to them and say, well, why do you want to hold on to the idea and concept that God is a rageful God? What do you get out of that emotionally? Now by this stage, most of them will be in apoplexy probably. <laughs> in other words, they'll be, they'll be having a major meltdown. And, and if that's the case, then you've got to ask yourself the question, why am I trying to convince somebody of the truth who doesn't want to know the truth? What's my law of attraction here? Why am I attracting into my life people who do not have a desire for truth, right? but rather who just have a desire to argue? What inside of me emotionally causes that attraction? Because the truth is when you deal with the emotions inside of yourself of why you like a good argument, you will attract less people in your life who want to have a good argument with you because in the end you'll walk away from most of them. So, so I would try reasoning on a few basic things, principles like that. There's a, there's a lot of technicals you could get into if you knew the Bible well, but there's no point in those technicals if the person has the inability to even have any logical reasoning. And by the way, on earth, logical reasoning isn't very common. Right? You know? Have you noticed that? 
It's not very common, you know. We, we, um, this, whole, this whole course is now in university that you can go to to learn the principles of logical reason. And you know why they have those courses? Because the majority of people on earth have no idea how to logically reason. We make supposition after presumption <laughs> in our life. That's what we do. And, uh, and, and so all you can do is appeal to their sense. Of, do you, like, don't you think God would have promoted something that's logical? Well, if it's logical, let's look at the logicalness of this. Let's use the intellect God has given us to examine the whole thing. And when they kick off the faith argument with you, oh, but you don't understand faith because you now understand faith from the, what we've discussed to be the assured expectation of the things hoped for and all those other things. So you know what faith is now and you know what it feels like inside of you and you can describe, have a conversation with them about faith if you want. But at the end of the day, if a person does not wish to listen to the truth and you wish to give it to them, the question you need to ask yourself is, why am I attracting people constantly who do not wish to listen? Often it's not obvious when you start the conversation that they're not interested. You just oh, kind totally. of, you lead into it you lead and into you get it. it into a certain point. Yep. And, and what happens with me is I, I get bogged down and I don't know how to proceed so I basically give up and say, well, that's fair enough, you know, have a happy day. And, I, um, and so the question then becomes why can't you feel their emotion at the beginning of the conversation? I'm getting better at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but see, that is even a skip over because that didn't answer the question as to why. Well, I wasn't sensitive to, to that's it. That's it. That's the answer. Right. Because it, so basically you could come away saying, well, why wasn't I sensitive to this person? Why, why wasn't I sensitive? This was the kind of person who didn't want to hear. What, what's going on inside of me that causes me to want to speak to a person who I, I can't feel doesn't has that emotion that they don't want to hear things from me because trust me there is literally hundreds of thousands if not there's millions of people on the earth right at this moment who are perfectly ready willing able and desirous of listening to divine truth yeah that's the, that's the truth what i've just said right wow. the problem is that our soul condition prevents them from finding us do you, do you see our soul condition prevents them from finding us. D does you see what I'm... You can see that? What, what caused you to find me? There were... No, that, no. What was in you first? A desire for what? For truth. A desire for truth was what your, caused you on your part to find me. What caused me to find you? I felt your desire for truth... And somehow our souls created the circumstance where we met. Some of you I met personally and privately. Sometimes we met in a public place. Sometimes we met some persons I've met down the street. Like That's how it works. So, so the truth is, as we get into the state where, we, where we're not preventing the truth from being demonstrated to others, we'll find more and more people will be attracted to us who want to hear the truth. And there are millions of people in the state where they want to hear the truth, just like you. Right? But our condition prevents them from being attracted to us at this moment. And that's what we need to realise. So what, what I do with every interaction where people are not listening, I look at myself firstly and go, OK, what's this about for me? You know, what, what am I trying to do here? And sometimes I've found myself trying to justify you know, the divine truth to them. Sometimes I've found myself getting, you know, annoyed with their, um, you know, totally logical, you know, reasoning. Uh, sometimes, and every one of those things was an emotion in me that was unloving, being projected at them. Does that make sense? And, if I and remember from what we said in our previous discussion that every opportunity, every moment is an opportunity where God is giving us a gift that we can choose to be in love or not. So... So you're attracting some Christian people into your life who don't want to listen to the message of truth. So this is an opportunity. What is annoying to you about the Christian faith? What is an, these are lots of good things to go into, do you see? Like lots of I, good don't, I don't know much about it, I have to confess. Okay, so number one is I don't know about it. Now, if you're teaching people, wouldn't it make sense to learn a bit about what they feel? Doesn't that make sense? Like... Like, so, so surely if I was going to give a talk to a, a group of Muslims, it would be wise for me perhaps even to read the Quran. 
so that I know what's in it. Yep, so I've actually started reading the Quran. Because I know sooner or later that's going to happen. Does that make sense? And, and I've never read it completely my entire life. And so I decided I wanted to read it. So I down, you can download them on the net. It's not a worry. You just download them. And away you go. You know, you can read them. Right? And I have read the Book of Mormon. So I, I know what to say to some Mormons about the Book of Mormon and so forth. What, what would you say? <laughs> since, my, since my brother's a bishop in the Mormon church. Of course, yeah. And, and, and I would focus on the same principles really in the yeah. end. In the end, I would focus on the logic. Because in the end, you can have arguments about what the text actually says, but they don't really get you very far emotionally. Mm. You know, you, so whenever the person is angry with me, I say, I say to them, you're angry with me right now. That's not loving. I thought Christians were meant to be loving. <laughs> and that, that's not a judgment? No. Why is that a judgment? I'm just telling them the truth, that they're being unloving to me by being angry. That's the truth. Yep. So that, that's the truth. I'm not judging him. I'm not saying you're condemned to eternal hellfire <laughs> now. Now that you're being angry with me, that's it. You've been angry with Jesus, man. That's the worst thing. <laughs> that's all that, right? So, so, so the truth is that we can say the truth about you know what's being projected us at any one moment. Most of us try to avoid that, you see, and we've got to look at why we avoid calling emotions for what they are. You know, and most of the time it's because we hope to make a point, but the point is the emotion. The, see, all of our interactions with people are either about love or they're not about love. They're not about the intellect, are they really? The intellect has, a, has not a very good capacity, either, as I've said before, to actually do much at all, aside from reason, if it's not influenced by negative emotions. <laughs> but if it's influenced by negative emotions, it can't even reason properly. Right? And that's the truth. And so what I would do is ask them why they want to believe the Bible is God's only word. Why do they want to believe that God is a God of rage? Because the Bible says that. And if they're accepting the whole Bible as God's word, they've got to accept that. Because it's kind of all or nothing, isn't it? Because yeah, if, exactly. if, they, if they believe all the things that, that suit them and fit in with their uh, yeah. philosophy of life, then they can't really exclude anything. That's right. So the Christians who believe that the Bible is flexible in the sense that there are some things in the Bible they don't agree with, they're much easier to talk to than the Christians who believe that all the Bible, every single word, is God's word. The people who believe that all the Bible, every single word, is God's word and only God's word and it's the only word of God that there is on the planet, those people are much more difficult to, to, to talk to because they already have a very, very fixed idea. Other ones are very easy to talk to. You can reason with them on lots of different subjects. But you're attracting many of the ones who believe the Bible is the only word of God. And so the key is to firstly look at their own group of emotions. Secondly, reason with them on the subject of love and an infinite God, and therefore infinite truth. So there can never be a complete revelation of truth from God. So therefore the Bible is never a complete revelation from truth of God. And the Bible itself actually says, but you don't need to know this really, in the end those two reasonings are fine, but the Bible does say in Revelation that further scrolls will be opened, that new revelation will be given. Right? So the Bible itself does actually say that there will be new revelations of truth given to the earth uh, other than what's in the Bible. Right? So I would look more closely though on what's actually emotionally going on for the person. Why do they want to believe in a God of rage? You know one of the main reasons why we want to believe in a God of rage? Because every single person we're really angry with, we would like God to do the job for us on them. <laughs> That's the real reason. And so we would like to prefer God to be a God of rage because every person we judge as bad, we want God to punish. Uh, we're not even willing to feel that maybe, maybe God's viewpoint of bad and ours is completely different. Right? So there are a lot of those kind of emotions. Why do I want to believe that, God is, that the Bible is God's only word? Because that then gives me a rule book to follow because I don't want to trust my emotions. I don't want to take personal responsibility for my actions. And yet, you could say, Jesus said in the first century that there'll be many people who say, Lord, Lord, did we not expel demons in your name and did we not prophesy in your name and did we not do all of these things in your name? And in, in response, the Lord said to them, Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. There are many people who are practicing the Bible right at this moment 
who are workers of lawlessness that God doesn't even know. And the Bible itself says it. Right, so, so there are many, once you dig in a bit deeper and read the Bible, you, you can pick out things that are very helpful in helping you in your argument. Um, not that it should be an argument. No, no, it should be an uh, exchange, shouldn't it? Thanks so yeah, much. focus those, on those things, Peter. And, Thank you. And see what goes on for you emotionally. There's a frustration in you emotionally about it. So you let yourself feel that frustration. What that's that's more, about. It's maybe more of a sadness because when, what you were talking about in the last uh, session was um, how God gives us a gift. And um, mm. from my perception, that the, the ultimate gift that, that any person could ever be lucky enough to find out about in, in the whole of their eternity is to find out about the divine love path and how to follow it. Yep. And we, we've all been given that gift. Mm. And I, I feel a... a, a a strong desire to spread the word because mm. wow, what a gift! Mm. I mean, what yeah. a gift to give to somebody to give them the chance to, to to be able to partake in that. I agree. I agree, and and I feel a degree of the same kind of emotion at times, um, where the people who r think they are doing God's will and following it often are way off the path of following God's will anywhere near it. In fact, and uh, but but to be frank. Many of them are doing so because they wish to hold on to concepts of information because of their own pride. They don't do it for many other reasons many times. Or they want to be stay with their families. Or they, you know, they've, there's family issues and there's all sorts of reasons. But isn't it that they've just received incorrect information that they've decided to believe and they've never had the opportunity to find out any other information? No, Peter. What, no. what it actually is, is every thi single thing we believe comes from an emotional openness to accepting the belief. Do, do you understand? See, see, there must be an emotional openness emotionally, so there must be openness emotionally to accept a belief inside of the soul before the belief can pass through that emotion and into the soul. Right? So that for the belief to enter the soul, there has to be an emotional openness to the belief. So let's say I state, make the statement, God is a God of wrath, which the Bible actually says. Right? Now, if I have an open, uh, openness emotionally to that concept that, that love is angry sometimes, which I could easily get, couldn't I, from my parents who, who are there belting me and saying, I'm doing this because I love you, that creates the emotional openness to the false belief about God. Do you see? And so this false belief about God, that God is a God of wrath, now has the capacity to enter me because of how my parents had treated me. So actually, the emotional openness to the false belief is the issue, not the false belief itself. You see, if we weren't emotionally open to the false belief, it could never enter our soul, ever. All right? So if inside of yourself you'd been loved from the day you were born, or from the day you were conceived, right the way through to now, and somebody told you that God's a God of wrath, you'd go, what? Even my parents weren't wrathful. Mm. And my parents are a lot less than God. You know? So how could God be wrathful? That, Im that Im belief would never enter you. Can you see? Mm. That one belief would never enter you that way. So, so it, the issue really is the emotional openness to the belief that causes the acceptance of the belief and in fact causes the creation of beliefs. Many of you in your past have had a deep emotional openness to the beliefs of reincarnation. Right? And there's a lot of reasons why that's the case. It, uh, it felt like it answered a lot of your emotions at the time. And for many of you still does. Right? You, many of you have emotional openness to the concept that God is everything. In other words, there's no entity called God, but rather God is the universe. Does that make sense? And, and many of you have an emotional openness to that concept or belief that was created throughout your childhood. Can you see where that might come from? From your parents? The openness to that? What do your parents teach you? That, that their emotions are everything, don't they? So there's a lot of things like that that happen where we don't see the linkages until later. And, and so, so what we need to do is we look at every belief, instead of judging the belief, the belief for what it is, and here I go again, just...
get that right, earpiece back in. We're, instead of judging the belief for what it is, we need to see that the issue is not the belief itself, but our emotional openness to unloving beliefs, period. That's the issue we're really facing. And so many of the Christians have emotional openness to a concept that God is a revengeful God. Right? And by the way, so do many Muslims. Right? And this is why we have Muslims and Christians fighting a lot, because they both have the same concept of beliefs, which are false, because in the end God's not either those, those things at all. So whenever you see or you're discussing with somebody about their belief systems, focus more on understanding their emotions of why that belief system entered them. Do you, do you follow me with that? Because when you, when, you when you have some fellow feeling for the belief system that's entered them and the reasons why, there is automatically a stronger openness in them to listening to you because they now feel like they're being, mis they're being understood more and they're being judged less. In, in the Judas messages, uh, he talks about how um, rather than criticise the few things where you've got a, a point of difference with another person, yep. to try and f find the common ground and build on that yep. so that you can build a bridge between you and the other person. That's right. Um, but, but understand that common grounds all begin at the emotional level, not the intellectual level. So the common ground of myself and, another, and a Christian who believes the Bible is God's only word, a common ground might be that we both wish to be love. So let's start there. Mm. What does that mean? When you're angry with someone, are you loving them then? Well, if, if we're angry with someone and we're not loving them, then why is God loving when he's angry? No? There's a lot of reasoning points we can follow in the end, but, but if, we, if, we, if we neglect to see that it's all emotions where we need to, res to have a common ground and we start thinking it's just intellectually that we need to have a common ground, mm. we're going to miss the entire point of the divine love path in a, in a way. Yeah. So work on the emotional connectedness with everyone. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And um, can I up to more than up to back there? Thanks. So if you keep your hand up more than that's it. Yeah. That's it. If we have a mic up there. Um, AJ, I've um, tried to talk to um, some of my closest friends about the divine love teachings and about about yourself and the fact that you're Jesus. And um, what I get often is. Um, Sort of a lot of heckling, like you know, <laughs> oh yeah, he's he's pretty good on most things, but you know he's got it wrong on the reincarnation part. Or, mm -hmm. or I've got another friend who he says, oh yeah, okay, so what is Jesus? But why does he have to tell everyone? You know, he he messed it up the first time by telling everyone, and now he's doing it again. And they have these massive, big emotional reactions. And um, inside of me, I um, I feel really um, sort of frozen because I I. I, I see it as a, a gift and an opportunity for transformation that, that's just lost. Yeah. So well, let, let's again start at the emotional level. When they heckle me, they're making fun, aren't they, yeah. of my choices. Right? Which they're perfectly able to do, aren't they? Of course. You're allowed to make fun of anybody on this planet, including Jesus, if he's living here. All right. So, so they're making fun of my choices. Now let's translate this into a personal feeling for you. This means these same people are going to do what with you? Uh, judge me. They're going to make fun of? Of me. Yeah. Mm. Right. So your law of attraction is you have people making fun of me, mm. And you know that if you continue with them, they'll make fun of you. Mm. And can you see what the emotion might be inside of you? What do you feel when you're made fun of? Um, I get really angry. Yep. And I also feel a lot of sadness. All right, so let's start with the anger. Mm. Why do you get really angry? Um, because 
because I believe I've found a, an aspect of truth and mm -hmm. I'm getting criticised and heckled for it. Yeah, but that, that's not a reason for your anger. Okay. See, the truth is you can be criticised and heckled and mm. still not get angry. Okay. So, can you see this? Like, see, a lot of times we, we, when we talk about our anger and rage, that it starts within us, we say, oh, I'm angry because, and we say the reason why, mm. but actually it's not the reason why, it's the effect of the reason why. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so, so we yeah. need to look at the real reason why we're angry. It's not yeah. because they heckle you and make fun of you or potentially will do so. Mm. What is it? What do you feel when they heckle and make fun of you that you don't want to feel? I think maybe I feel devalued or... Okay, you feel devalued. Mm. Any others? Keep going Misunderstood. If you want. Yeah, uh, valued. Um, Misunderstood. Um, just like, uh, maybe I'm stupid. You feel less stupid, yeah. yeah. They, they're basically saying you're stupid, aren't yeah. they? Whoops. Yeah for yeah. believing in a Jesus on earth, yep. that's crazy. Well, and that I'm crazy. You know. Yeah, you're crazy. Yeah. yeah. All right. And yeah. Ju judged is, a, is a, um, a loaded word for me. Yeah, well, let's, yeah. let's be more specific with okay. judged because judge is a very general feeling. Is, yeah. what, what happens when you're judged? Like, what are they really doing to you? They're really saying that they are better than you, mm. aren't they? Yeah. So they're putting you lesser than them. Yes. Does that make sense? So, yes. So what they're doing is they're telling you that you're stupid and an idiot and you're less than less them. Less than them, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Right, so, whoops, less tan. No, no, less than. <laughs> less tan, bit hard on Sunshine Coast. Um, so, so what we need to do is, right, we feel angry and what's happening a lot at the moment, you just feel angry and frustrated, mm. but you're not allowing yourself to actually feel the grief of these uh, groups of emotions. Mm -hmm. now, now, yes, you are being devalued. That is the truth. In that moment, you are being devalued. Mm -hmm. In that moment, you are being misunderstood. Mm -hmm. In that moment, they are treating you like you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. In that moment, they are treating you like you're crazy. Yeah. The, the issue is, you either need to cry about it to the point where it no longer affects you yeah. rather than getting angry yeah. or you, you need to, there, there needs to be some belief changes inside of you. Yes. Just because a thousand people tell you you're crazy, it doesn't mean you're crazy. Yeah. Right? And just because a thousand people tell you that you're stupid for believing something, it doesn't mean you are stupid. Mm. It just means that they believe you are and their belief may be the error. Mm. Right? And I would uh, maybe reason with them about that, but I doubt whether you'll get much, f much further than where you get with them. But I would actually look, this is the emotions that are actually being triggered, yeah. and these are the emotions you need to feel to change the situation. Yeah. When you feel those emotions, what will happen is you'll attract people who are genuinely interested mm. in the truth. Right. So many of you are not attracting people who are genuinely interested in the truth, you're attracting people because of your unhealed emotions that you're unwilling to feel. Does that make sense? Mm. So many of you are very unwilling to feel this one, that everybody thinks you're a nutcase. Mm. Right? I've yeah. had lots of experience with that emotion. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that emotion completely. Right? Yeah. Many of you ha have a lot of trouble. Now, to, to go for me, going through that was a process of a lot of grief. Right? Just to let go of a lot of sadness. Mm -hmm. In the first century, I had my mother following around saying everybody was, uh, to everybody that I was a nutcase. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the memory of that in this life just caused me to cry for days and days until mm -hmm. I released that emotion. Yeah. Right? So, so I need to focus on these emotions. These are what are creating the event. Mm -hmm. and, and I need to see that they're making fun of me is God's opportunity yeah. for me. So God's giving me this beautiful gift. Yeah. Well, through my law of attraction, this beautiful gift, I'm giving you an opportunity to deal with this your crazy emotion that you've got going on inside of yourself. Yeah. Right? It's a great opportunity to deal with it now because don't you think come a year's time when this gets bigger and, every, and maybe gets in the media and all that crap, yeah. like, don't you think by that stage like, you're going to be like have a lot more people saying that you're a nutcase than you have right now, don't you think? Totally. Okay, yeah. so isn't it great to deal with that emotion and have yeah. some firmness in yourself that you know your connection with God is growing and you know this is working for you, so you yeah. are firm in yourself about the truth? Yeah, yeah see so yeah. what I did, I think I projected my grief onto them and I sort of went, oh you poor thing, you know, you, you're missing a great opportunity and I sort of made it all about them 
but actually it's my grief and then this mm. is where I can just exactly if, if take it back and in. This is a very important lesson to learn in your interaction with others. Mm. Does that make sense to everyone? Really important lesson to learn because, because if you understand that every single situation you're attracting is this beautiful opportunity to work through an emotion that is obviously within you, otherwise you wouldn't be attracting it. So now, like at home, I have hardly any people now making fun of me personally. They make fun of Mary now <laughs> more <laughs> than they do of me. Um, and, and they make fun to Mary about me, but they don't do it to me. Does that make sense? So, so the thing is that we need to see all of these things as an opportunity to deal with an emotion mm. rather than an opportunity to try and attack somebody or... Yeah you know, do something in an unloving state with them. Yeah. So the anger projection back at them is an unloving state. Yeah, I stopped doing yeah. that after That's a while great. and then started hitting the grief yeah. directly. But My first question would be, if I was listening to you, is, yeah, you're talking about love and you're getting angry with me right now. Exactly. It's just from me making fun of you. What's wrong with you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. The truth is that people can get up in a public forum and make fun of you and they possibly will uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much people make fun of you, uh, right where you're sitting in the audience or right up with them, you would be able to handle it in good humour and still and not feel yeah. bad inside of yourself and feel yeah. upset and you'll still be loving. Yeah. 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 Right. That's a great place to be. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Go across right next to you. Um. I'm hearing, I'm hearing. <laughs> my ears are still open even okay. though I'm facing <laughs> um, My experience in uh, the law of attraction with other people has changed in the last, let's say last half year mm -hmm. because I was, I was going through a lot of grief. And you hold that microphone up so we don't. I was going through a lot of grief and a lot, lot of emotions mm -hmm. and um, I was last year, I have been in Germany and I was really so enthusiastic because it was the first time I saw your first DVDs and I was telling to all my friends about you and about the Divine Love Pass and I was really, uh, I was enthusiastic and mm -hmm. you see that? Mm -hmm. So, but it didn't touch them. No. Because I haven't had the experience with the Divine Love and with my prayer. Yeah. But now I'm talking to these people and That's they listen to me yes. and I'm sending DVDs over there. And, yeah. it's and this is a very important lesson. Uh, it's because it's an experience in my soul. You see, when you first heard the message, yeah, I was here's your brain right up yeah. here, somehow loosely connected to your soul generally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Right, and uh, that's our spirit body's brain, if you like, and uh, our spirit body's mind. And, and the truth enters here, and it goes into here, and it resonates with the soul, but as yet, we are yet to make soul changes. Yeah. Right? Now, now, our interactions with everyone around us are only based on soul changes. This is why when we first hear all the truth and it resonates with us, we become enthusiastic, we go and talk about it, hardly anybody generally will listen to us. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because they are feeling our soul hasn't changed yet. Does that make sense? Yes. And so because the soul hasn't changed <coughs> yet, they, they don't see how this is any different to anything else. But as soon as this soul thing starts changing, as soon as you start releasing emotion, that's how your soul changes. Mm -hmm. Releasing the unloving emotions and accepting the loving emotions is mm -hmm. how your soul changes. As mm -hmm. soon as you start doing that, now their soul, which is over here interacting with your soul, mm -hmm. they're feeling changes. And they're going, hmm, I feel something different here. Right? This person is... Yeah, you know, six months ago she told me about this stuff and, you know, it's all, it's like, it all sounded like heaven of rubbish to me. But, but look at the changes. You see, you see, it's only when this becomes real that everybody else around you will start listening to you. Yeah, it's quite miraculous. Mm. I experienced it. It's wonderful, isn't it's it? It's very, very touchy for me. Yeah. And it all... <coughs> 
Also, my love increases for these people. Yes. And also, the spirits come and talk to me more. Yeah. yeah. And they actually it. can guide you too in every yeah. one of these interactions. It's so, so the spirits are actually working along with you. Yeah, it's with quite these friends amazing. as yeah. well. And also, you mm. in your sleep state are often working with them as well. And so, mm. the but the beauty is everything changes when your soul changes. Not, really not, really not them, <coughs> yours. So you can speak of, and this has been the trouble historically with the Divine Truth Movement on Earth. The Paget messages were finished in 1923 or something like that. I can't remember the exact date, but I think it was about then. And then they were published in the 40s or so. And so the Earth had 40 or 50 years of the Paget messages. So why doesn't the Earth know all of this truth? Yeah. It's because no one on Earth actually has lived them yet. You see? And it's the living of them that, is attracts, that attracts other people wanting to live it. Right? And so you can speak in your head to another person who's in their head about the divine truth all you want. And there may be some resonance in their soul even at the time. But unless they feel a change in your soul, you will not attract a difference in your life with those people. And that's a basic thing to remember. I have one more question. Sure. Uh, <coughs> the previous comment wasn't a question, but go ahead with the question. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, because uh, my my lang my home language is German. Yep. And um, I was talking to my grandfather, and do I, uh, if I speak in English, was it, uh, do they understand all the English in the spirit? <laughs> it depends. Do I have what to speak in my home language? It depends it? what condition they're in. Um, if they're in a condition uh, usually above the second sphere or third sphere, the majority of them are able to listen in the, majori in the majority of the, pro the, the po prominent languages on earth. But if they've only just passed over or they're in the first sphere or in the hills, there's a high likelihood they aren't able to learn language in all the different languages. And so therefore talking to them in their home language will connect them emotionally to their earth-based events see. a lot better than if you talk to them in a different language. Because that came to me all sudden. Mm -hmm. I need to talk to him in my home language. Spot on. So yeah. that is an indicator. Whenever you feel those emotions, again, yeah. trust them. Just trust them and start speaking in the language that they are speaking because yeah. there, there are emotional connections that happen through language when a person is yet to progress in the spirit world yeah. and talking to a person in the same language that they are actually still speaking in the spirit world can help them to a large degree even though they're capable of learning the other language. Yeah. yeah. We had a, a spirit come to us uh, uh, about uh, eight, ten days ago, whatever it is, when we were with the group of mediums in um, Coffs Harbour, wasn't it? And a spirit came to us and, and spoke in a language that's nearly 60,000 years old. And you could feel all of her emotion, right? And then she, then she said, I'll, I'll translate that all into English now for you. And then she, but, but her emotion was in her language from 60,000 years ago. And then she translated it into English and she was apologising to Mary in particular, but to Mary and myself about how she'd treated us in the first century and, and for a, f a fair bit of this life. And she was just in a lot of grief about it. She's in repentance about that. And she was just talking to us about that. But she was speaking a language from 60,000 years ago. Yeah. So something else I uh, always wanted to share. Yeah. yeah. Um, because from my past. Can I, can I stop yeah? you now? Why do you want to share? Uh, I always wanted to say it. Right. What do um, you? To you. <laughs> why? <laughs> uh, because it was so overwhelming for me this experience right. I had once. Um, just when we, we drove home in the car, and all, all of a sudden I felt I'm falling into a trance space. And there were spirits talking to me, and it was very overwhelming because they said I should talk to Hitler. Mm -hmm. I, I, I could, I mean, it was so overwhelming. I, and it took me a long time to, I thought I need to release a lot of emotions and, and look a lot of uh, movies about the, the war and about yep. Nazis and all that. Mm -hmm. And I did it, and I, I don't know, now I'm. I'm feel like I'm stronger now. <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. It was fear. I, I <coughs> have, have you finished up talking to Hitler? Not yet. Not I, yet. I, no. 
it was so overwhelming for mm. me, really, when that happened. And, and I felt I need to get more information yeah. about him and about the situation and about yeah. Nazi. So I watched quite a bit of movies. My, my personal <coughs> feeling is when these kind of in, you know, I, I impressions I mean, come to you, to follow them, because, because at the end of the day, um, many of you, I notice um, in the past we've had a lot of questions about ones like Hitler, right? Or Stalin or ones like that, who have been quite damaging people while they're on the earth. But many of, many of us are not facing the truth yet that actually they were the creation of their environment to a large degree. Like, like a person like Hitler cannot come onto the scene without a lot of things being prepared first, right? Yeah. And a lot of spirit influence involved yeah, in the process. And so when a person like Hitler passes and all that spirit influence ceases, they now come face to face with their own life, which if you can imagine for Hitler would be a very, very painful experience, right? <coughs> and, and if a person is suggesting to you to talk to that person, there's a high likelihood the person is willing to listen. And that's why it's worth doing there it. There were more spirits talking to me in that moment, I mm -hmm. felt. What I'm suggesting to you, if you're a medium, is to allow... A lot of times these spirits come to you to talk to you to learn truth. And they're, when they come to you to learn truth, they are ready to learn truth. The beauty of spirit interaction is this. You don't have to generally convince the spirit to listen to you when he's arrived at your doorstep because he's already wanting to listen to you. When the problem on earth with truth is hardly anybody wants to listen to it and you've got to convince them first, usually over a period of years before they'll even listen to you. In the spirit world it's very, very different. So take the, the opportunities if you're a medium to speak with the spirits that come to you, deal with your fears and all the other things that yeah. prevent you from doing so. Take the opportunity to speak with them when it's there. Because, it, because these opportunities can result in great good to people in the spirit world, but also people here. Because you talked about gift, and then it came to me. It's a it's gift, a you see. Gift. In that moment, God's gift comes to you, and you often yeah. pass it by because of fear or some yeah, other emotion. Yep. And in the end, while you might not know much about Hitler's personal life, the truth is, you do know a, lot, a fair bit about his public life, obviously, most people do, but, but even that's not important. What's really important is what are his emotions? What is he feeling now? How can we help him to get to a, stay a different place? How can we help him progress? How can we help him work through repentance? How can we help him work through his false beliefs? That's the same almost for any person. Yeah. Right? Mm. Okay. Yeah. You keep, keep your hand up. Hi. Um, I don't consider myself to be, or I don't feel myself to be a very mediumistic person, although mm -hmm. I do feel, I have felt energies around at times. When I feel that I'm tapping into emotion, there's often a couple of things that happen. One is I'll go completely emotionally numb. Right. Yep. And that can happen in various ways and sometimes it has been quite disorientating because I've just felt myself pulled out of an emotion. Yep. The other thing that frequently happens is I feel this pain in my throat and that can be quite extremely painful, right. which okay. then pulls me out of the emotion anyway. So my question is how important is it for me to know um, is this spirit influence or is it my own fears? Or do, um, do I deal with it the same way or do I deal with it differently? Well, that's the thing, is that whether you know whether it's a spirit influence or not, it's really the same way every time in dealing with the emotion anyway. So it doesn't really matter if you don't know whether there's a spirit there or whether there is one there in the end. All that matters is what, what's going on. And what's going on is you're starting to express an emotion, then you go numb, and you have throat pain as a result of that or often have throat pain. Now throat pain is all about again feeling free to express the emotion. So, so obviously you're going through a process at the moment where you're working through a blockage and the blockage is I, I want to feel the emotion but I have blockages to fully wanting to express the emotion. Right? 
And, and so what happens then is I have a denial of acceptance, denial, acceptance, denial of the emotion until I work through that blockage. And once I work through the blockage, I will accept the emotion. And ironically, at that time too, I will no longer have any throat pain while I'm going through any emotions. I'll only have throat pain when I'm denying them. Does that make sense? So that, that's what it's telling me. And yes, there is spirits who attach to that, naturally. And those spirits, when they attach to that, naturally are going to assist you go numb and they're going to assist you you know to close down your throat if that's what they wish to create so can you see it's like but so so even though the spirits are there um of course you're going to attract them when your own emotion attracts them yeah so focus on your own emotion you have a deep fear about expressing your grief yeah, well, that's when the throat pain comes in. It's exactly. usually associated with grief. Yeah, and so, so I would actually look at your fear of grief. So rather than forcing yourself to deal with more grief, allow yourself to see how afraid you are of your grief and ask yourself why. Write down all the reasons why you're afraid of grief. Now, a lot of these come from our childhood where we were punished for our grief when we were young. Um, many parents don't want to see their child cry and particularly if their child cries seemingly unnecessarily is what the parent would think uh, not knowing that the child's just expressing the parent's grief but the, the parent then goes you're expressing you know you're crying for no reason I'll give you something to cry about and then fear kicks in in the child of every time they start crying I get out of my grief and close down the expression of the grief because I'm afraid so look at the fears of grief. There'll be a number of them. List them and allow yourself to feel them. <coughs> so allow yourself to feel how terrified you were when you were crying when you were little and somebody was going to punish you more for crying. Like allow yourself to feel what that felt like. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Thanks. Good day. Um, if we go up there, over there, and then we'll go to Soraya on this side. So she's over here. Hi, AJ. How are you doing? Um, I'm not sure if my question is the same. I think it's a little bit different. But I've been told both by Mary and Millie that I have a lot of spirits, attachments. Mm -hmm. And um, I have, on a daily basis, very intense emotional pain. Yeah. And for, for many years, I've... Um, spent a lot of time crying that out yep. if I don't cry it out then I can't focus on anything I can't relate can't, can't live I can't, the rest live. Of your life. I can't mm. do anything yep. so I let it out yep. and I've done a lot on the nat natural love path yep. um, of <coughs> dealing with emotions and stuff and yet I, I, I'm now told that I have that they're not my own emotions they're just um, the yep. spirit's emotions and there's no point in going into them because they're not my emotions, so... Yep, but let's um. look at... Uh, what, what's being said to you is very true. Um, but let's look at what's really going on and why you attract them. That's the important thing. So here's you, right? And here's the spirits around you who have a lot of grief that you're willing to feel for them. So what you need to do is look at the hook you have into them is that I am willing to feel other people's emotions. Why am I willing to do that? What, what do you get out of that? There's got to be something you get out of that. Besides relief. There's got to be something in your childhood here, can you see? Yeah. And what's happening is because of this willingness to feel other people's emotions, what ha what's happening is that, is that any spirit can come along to you and be with you and you will willingly feel their emotion with them and they feel a degree of camaraderie with you as a result and so therefore they even feel more attracted to stay with you so one time when we walked past each other in the hallway just here there was a an angry man with you and and I felt him express his rage through you at me does that make sense and you didn't even notice you wasn't you weren't even aware another time I felt you, um, when we walked past each other, I felt a group of angry women spirits with you. 
that and you were in a you were allowing them to connect into your and to, to be frank you don't have as much rage as many of the spirits with you have does that make sense they're expressing it through you and it's because you're willing to hook into them you're willing to do this for them for some reason and my suggestion is to pray about so rather than me tell you the reasons because there are a number of them from your childhood is to start praying about what are the childhood reasons why I allow other people to express their emotion through me why do I want to do this I have a bit of a sense of it mm -hmm. what um, do you feel it might be well my mother um, basically didn't want me and I feel that on a very subtle level through my life right from the start she blamed me mm -hmm. for her emotional upset her emotional pain yep so what did you have to do um, I I had to please her um, and, and, and I took on her her emotions yeah I I guess I I felt it was my fault mmm false belief how could it be your fault you're just a child I do yet. tend to think that other people's emotion it, it's a, a my mm. it's my fault now you're getting really close to it yeah, yeah. and it's false belief and and yeah. and I feel that if I can be open to their emotion and and feel with them then I'm not going to be blamed for it or something and this is your hook into these does that make sense once you dis once you feel through that emotion you will actually release this hook and you will no longer allow spirits who surround you to express their emotions through you as a result I'm afraid of everyone being angry with me and yes yeah. and in fact these are going to be quite angry with you for a period of time when you break this hook because mm. I want that back and the truth is your mother is exactly the same your mother wants you to feel her stuff and as soon as you stop doing that is your mum still on earth no no she's passed too but I feel that as if she's with me a lot yeah she is actually one of the people with you yeah and she doesn't want you to do that either she wants you to continue doing this to continue feeling for her feeling for her feeling for her that's her addiction and your addiction is is because of your you're afraid mm. you're afraid of breaking that link mm. yeah my suggestion is to feel the truth of this and the truth of this is that is that you cannot feel anyone else's emotions to a point that will relieve them in any way mm. that, that's the basic truth of the whole world you are not able to feel someone else's emotions for them in order to, to relieve them it's impossible God designed the soul perfectly and it's impossible for any relief to be gained by a person in your mum's condition through you so it's actually based around some false belief premises as well that I can feel for them and I'll make it better for them and all mm. these kind of things mm. and, and, and I get some um, uh, I don't know I became a counsellor some years ago yeah um, for, a, a for a similar brief reason. time mm. and uh, yeah I get um, I don't know, a feeling of being wanted I guess yes a feeling yeah. of worth mm, worth yeah, yeah. yeah a feeling of mm. your own worthiness mm. and this is your addiction mm your worth doesn't come from doing this your worth will actually come by from releasing the emotions that your mum created in you that, that you are worthless she mm. treated you as if you're worthless mm. and that she was the only person in your relationship that had any worth mm. does that make sense mm. so let yourself feel her treatment of you rather than rather than trying to create your worth by feeling for other people mm. it's impossible and this is a basic truth it's impossible to help a person by feeling their emotions for mm. them impossible God created perfect souls and it's impossible to do that you can certainly feel their emotions through you but there'll be no relief in them whatsoever mm. none whatsoever so every one of these spirits and this is why you've been doing it daily for hours at a time sometimes every one of these spirits is pushing some emotion through you but it's not relieving them at all nor is it helping you yeah. yet I have such intense emotional pain and that's the only way that I can well the intense emotional pain is caused by them yeah. that's their trigger for mm. you to do it 
Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. They're going to they're going to project at you more and more and more and more until you. you it, what I would suggest you do is stop for a moment, like for a couple of weeks, feel the pain that's within you, and realize that one of the reasons why this pain is within you is because they're projecting rage and anger at you, waiting for you to feel for them. And it's never going to stop if you keep doing it. It's never going to stop. Does that make sense? No? Yeah. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll give it a go. Well, the, the start is to start feeling this. Why am I willing to feel yeah. other people's yeah. emotions? Yeah. That's the start. Yeah. Allow yourself to pray about that, talk to God about that. Stop the addiction within yourself mm. as well. Stop mm. the addiction of feeling other people's emotions mm. for them. Mm. Every time you notice yourself doing it, stop yourself. Pray to God about it. Does Feel my sense? fear instead. Feel your fear yeah. of their anger projection. Yeah. So what you're doing is you're addicted to preventing other people's anger at you. Mm. Yeah. And that's because you're, you were addicted by your mother to prevent her rage at you. Mm. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Very so if you can see that as an addiction of trying to prevent their anger and rage, and so you do this for them, do this for them. But to be frank, people who are angry and rageful never give up their anger and rage this way. They have to feel their own emotions before they'll ever give up their anger and rage. Mm. So, so even you feeling, the, feeling for them doesn't release their anger and rage. It's still there. Mm. So it actually does nothing for them. Mm. Thank you. Good day. Uh, Ray, um, Sarai, we came to you. Next to us. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I've been through a pretty horrible time. <laughs> yep, I could feel that. Um, I actually started reading the Paget messages again after not reading them for about six months. Mm -hmm. And it was probably about maybe two, three months ago. And um, I've only gone th a third of the way through the first one, actually, at all. But um, when you were talking yesterday, oh, actually today, and s said talking about the gifts and you said sometimes special gifts are offered and they may never come along again mm -hmm. and in um, in particular part in the pageant messages that I just recently read mm -hmm. was talking about the gift of soul potentiality um, to receive, to divine, receive love. divine love mm -hmm. and um, oneness with God mm -hmm. and that um, the first death or the first, mm, it was withdrawn with, I think you talked about that when you were telling us about Amon and a man. And man. Yep, it was yeah. withdrawn. It was after withdrawn a, yep. at that time. Mm -hmm. And then with your birth, it was uh, 2,000 years ago, it was regifted. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it has been gifted since. Um, yeah, continuously then. since, yeah. But it will be withdrawn again? Yes. And that's called the in the Bible the Day of Judgment, or no. the Second Death. No, or no. There's um, a lot of misquotes from yeah. There's no relationship to what it's called in the Bible. I think in the in Paget messages it refers to it to as the Day of Judgment in and then as Second Death, meaning the same sort of thing happening as when um, Adam and Eve. Um, anyway. I stopped reading it because I went into fear. I right, thought, yeah. oh, when you drew that graph and I thought I'd gone right down the bottom and I thought, I can't, I can't come out of that dip. And well, Sarai, can I first dispel some of the untruths that you feel? <laughs> Firstly, when you receive divine love, you can't lose the divine love you've already received. Right? You can only act as if it's not there. There's a big difference between those two states, right? So the beauty of your soul is with divine love, when divine love enters your soul, it enters your soul permanently and it cannot exit your soul after that point. So it enters your soul, does its work, some of its transformational work, and then it just sits there ready for you to either reflect it or not in your life. Now, if you go through a period of time where you're not reflecting in your life and you're finding it real difficult and finding things a struggle, then it's like it's stagnant within your soul. And in fact, what the divine love does in that state is it screams at you. <laughs> 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 uh, 
right? So what it does is it say, get back on, get back on, get back on, you know, get back on the horse, basically, and you know, don't don't respond to this to this fear or whatever other emotions it is that are driving you to go away from it. And so when you receive divine love, there is no danger of you ever having lost it, right? After you've received some of it. So that does that mean that um, once you know I. Um once I have, I'm in that dip, that that my potential for um, becoming one with God will always be there. Yes, always. You see, once you first have the first inflow of divine love into your soul, the soul itself cannot ever get rid of it. And in fact, if you if you died, or something like that, or if your soul could die. The truth is, if, if your soul died while there was some, rela some divine love in it, what would happen is God would have to die because the love is directly connected to God. So for that reason, it's impossible for a soul who's already received divine love to actually not continue to receive divine love once it's begun. Does that make sense? So you, you only have to receive a little bit of divine love, just one little top up from one day <laughs> throughout your life, and now it's impossible for you to not ever have a continuous connection with God that you will eventually receive divine love continuously to the point of one with God and then even to the appointment of one with your soulmate. And it applies to the entire soul too, not just to the one half. So, so let's say there's two halves of the soul which are now in half, so they're now split. So there's one half and then the other half is split, right? And this is your half of the soul and your half of the soul you had one flash of inspiration about God, you had a longing for God for a half an hour. And that's all that's ever happened your entire life. Right? And what's happened is divine love has entered your soul into that case. Right? And the divine love now sits in here somewhere. It's now in your half of the soul. And because it's in your half of the soul, that entire soul now has no option but to receive more at some point, depending on its will. Does that make sense? And it can never lose it. Okay, that's important to me. Okay, <laughs> it's um, because I've been through, I've been feeling. Um, when I read that, I thought, oh, I can really relate to those demons in the hells, you know. And they think, oh well, bugger it, it's too hopeless. I'm just too um, yep. vulgar and ugly and rotten inside. That um, it's just too much work. Yeah. I might as well just play around in the mud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now, can I address that emotion? Because this is a very, very important emotion to address. And what it is, is an emotion, uh, and it's emotion really based around the shame of your own self. Does that make sense? Now, now you have a choice with shame. You have a choice to actually grieve the shame, or you have a choice to actually hold it underneath everything. Now, when, it, when a person holds shame underneath, they, they actually start then becoming a very desensitised person. They become so desensitised, in fact, that they can do many, many things that they wouldn't normally do because they've desensitised their soul to their own feelings. Do you follow me? Now, Mary's had a lot of experience with this in her own life in the first century. She had a period of her life that was very, very dark period of her life because she had a huge amount of grief that happened a lot, uh, quite a number of different rapes that occurred one after the other after the other and a huge amount of grief she then lost her child all, all of this happened in a period of a very short period of time she was only about 16, 17 years of age and she went into this really dark place and so she understands what that place feels like you know, that really dark place feels like inside of her and, and when you suppress this shame what happens is you then start building a castle on top of it trying to keep it down but you start living in the shame in other words you start creating more shameful events that make you feel worse about yourself and it, it's a very very powerful lesson of degradation that occurs to your own soul and many people on this planet and in the spirit world have been through it the key is to have a willingness to feel the grief of the shame does that make sense? So instead of acting in harmony with the shame, feel the grief that's in there about how shameful the actions have been. D does that follow? You, yeah. you get that? Yeah. Now, when I don't do that, what happens 
is this shame then dominates my life and a lot of the angry things that I choose to do trying to suppress the shame actually dominate the rest of my life. Does that make sense? And you'll finish up going into places that you'd never conceived possible that anybody could go into, let alone yourself, in that place if you're not careful. And yes, there are many, many spirits in that place where they ha are unwilling to feel the grief of their own shame and therefore they take actions which create even more shame within themselves and then they numb that and they go into a very angry place where they're willing to do lots of damage to themselves in particular but also to others and therefore you know the problem compounds and the actual uh, and act actually prostitution is a part of that process where you finish up prostituting yourself now some males do it in business a lot of times Females may do it actually in sexual prostitution or other areas. But, but what often happens is that we prostitute ourselves in that place, in a, in a self-hatred area. We, we actually start like really te telling ourselves that we're really bad and then we start acting as bad as we feel. The key is to stop and grieve. Because when you grieve, then all of that can let, let go and you don't need to be guided by those actions. Does that make sense? And it's a very powerful thing for you, Sarai, to, to actually allow yourself to grieve rather than punish yourself. When you get into punishing of self, by the way, what happens is you automatically attract a very large group of spirits who are willing to get you into a very dark condition very rapidly. When you punish yourself, you open a gateway between yourself and these spirits and these spirits will keep dropping thoughts into your mind and, drop, and just make you feel worse about yourself every day. And every oh, day, no, yep, and, and, and that doesn't need to happen, but it needs you to love yourself and just feel the shame. Does that make sense? Rather than, rather than acting towards yourself in a self-punishing manner. So it's very, very important for, you, for your progression to do that. Okay, thanks. Yeah? Okay. And what is the time, by the way? It's ten past six. Yeah, I, th I think it's time to stop, actually. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time this weekend. Enjoy, enjoy your week.